quantified modal logic. This is when things get super, super interesting. If we are doing arguments in philosophy, we are thinking about how things are, but also how they could have been and how they have to be. If we're going to reason about that stuff logically, it's quantified modal logic we need. So let's take a look. Hello everyone, welcome back to The Attic. We're doing a series of videos introducing the basic concepts of logic. We've done a few videos looking at modal logic and this week we're going to be looking in particular at quantified modal logic. This is like where we combine first order logic and modal logic together. We're adding the quantifiers to modal logic. If you're finding these videos helpful, make me happy for free and subscribe to the channel. So here we are going to be building on propositional modal logic that we looked at in the previous videos. We're going to be adding quantifiers to it. So you can think of quantified modal logic as taking propositional modal logic and first order logic and squishing them together. OK, so we could also be calling this first order modal logic. And I think a lot of my students, they prefer calling it that. At least last time I taught this and we did a test, this is what they wrote down. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's what they meant by that. OK, so let's start off with what is our language going to look like when we've got both modal logic stuff and first order logic stuff going on there? Well, just like in first order logic, we are going to have some names, constants. We are going to have variables. We are going to have predicates including the identity predicate. We are going to have the connectives, not, and, or, if, then, if, and only if. We are going to have the quantifiers for all and for some. And we're going to have the modal operators, the box and the diamond. So with all that stuff going on, what are the sentences going to look like? Well, here's a standard sentence of first order modal logic. It says that all Fs are Gs. Let's make that a bit more interesting by adding some modalities to it. We might get something like this. We've added a box, a diamond and another box. So this one says necessarily everything that is possibly an F is necessarily G. OK, so a different way of saying that would be necessarily everything that could be F has to be a G. So when we look at a sentence like this, there's kind of two ways in which those modal operators can show up. They can show up either de dicto or de re. What does that mean? Let's start with de dicto. So when we're talking about de dicto necessity, or possibility. We're really talking about a proposition, OK, a sentence that's true or false. And we're saying that it's necessarily true or false or that it could be true or false. Necessarily A, de dicto will mean that A is necessarily true. Possibly true, de dicto, means that A could be true. So that's one way in which these modal operators, thinking about them as meaning necessarily or possibly, that's one way in which they can be used. But we also have de re uses. And here we're thinking not so much about whole propositions, but we're thinking about particular individuals. So in first order logic, the whole point is that we can talk about or quantify over particular individual things. So in first order logic, we might say that I'm talking or you're listening or whatever. So when we add the modal operators and think about them as expressing possibility and necessity, we can then say things like, I'm necessarily human. You're necessarily human. You're possibly listening, etc. OK, so when we're talking about de re uses of modality, we're talking about a thing which has to be or could be a certain way. So think about all the ways that a thing could be. We might divide them up into the ways that it has to be and then perhaps the ways that it could be, but doesn't have to be. So here's an example of a de dicto use of the box saying that this sentence, everything is F, is necessarily true. So we'd read that as saying necessarily everything's F. Here's a de re use of the box. Everything is necessarily F. So for every individual thing, it is necessarily a human being or whatever. Here's a slightly different de re use. So we're saying that every F is necessarily G. So every person is necessarily conscious, let's say, maybe. OK, so these are both de re uses and here's a de dicto use. So for a de dicto use, we tend to find the box or the diamond outside the scope of that quantifier. 
But the day ray use, typically you're going to find it within the scope of a quantifier. So in those day ray uses, what we're really doing is we're applying a box or a diamond to an open sentence. So something like this or like this. And there are different ways of reading those out in English. So if we're thinking about the box as meaning necessarily and the diamond as meaning possibly, there's still kind of different glosses that we can put on those kind of sentences. So we could read this one as saying the X has to be F or the X must be F or the X is essentially F. OK, they're just kind of slightly different ways of saying the same thing. So diamond FX, that can be read as X could have been F or X might have been F or X is a possible F. OK, so this use of essentially X is essentially F. There are kind of a whole bunch of philosophical questions going on about exactly what we mean by that. Here, we're just taking it to mean that it's necessary of the thing in question, that it has that property. So this language of essence is sometimes paired with the language of things being accidentally a certain way. OK, so I'm essentially a human being, but right now I'm accidentally sitting down. That means that I don't have to be sitting down. I could have done this video standing up or I might have not been doing the video at all. I might have been running around or whatever. OK, so I'm essentially a human being, but accidentally sitting down. So this distinction between a thing being essentially F or it being accidentally F, that doesn't immediately map onto the box and the diamond language. OK, and that's because the diamond isn't a contrast to the box. If something is necessarily F, essentially F, then it is also possibly F. So, for example, it's true to say that I could be a human being because I actually am. So being essentially a human being, necessarily a human being, that doesn't rule out being possibly a human being in the way that we want to rule that out when we say that it's accidentally a certain way. OK, so what we mean when we say that something is accidentally a certain way is that it's that way, but it's not that way essentially. So we would express X is accidentally F as saying it's F, but it's not necessarily or not essentially F. It's F, but it's not essentially F. So we find this de re use of modality coming up right through philosophy. Perhaps one of the most famous arguments comes from Descartes. Remember him? So he has a whole bunch of different arguments saying that the mind and the body are distinct entities, distinct substances. But one of them, it can be reconstructed like this. So minds essentially think. They are essentially thinking entities. That's what it is, according to Descartes, to be a mind. But bodies, they don't essentially think. They're not essentially thinking entities, thinking substances. According to Descartes, the essence of body, of physical stuff, is to be extended in space, to take up space. Minds don't do that. So, Descartes concludes, minds aren't bodies. So that's kind of like a Leibniz's law type argument. We say that minds are essentially this way, bodies aren't essentially this way, so they are distinct. How would we write that argument out in quantified modal logic? We might do it something like this. So minds essentially think we can pass that as for all things. If it's a mind, then essentially it thinks. Bodies don't essentially think. Well, for all things, if it's a body, then it doesn't essentially think. It's not necessary that it thinks. So conclusion, minds aren't bodies. There's different ways to express that. But one way of doing it is saying, take any mind and any body, they're not the same thing. Is that a valid argument? Well, we haven't said yet what we mean by a valid argument. We have to look at what our models look like. But it turns out that, yeah, it's going to be a valid argument. If we try to construct a model where we have something that is both a mind and a body, what's going to follow from that? Well, that mind is going to be, in all possible worlds, a thinking thing. The body isn't. It's going to be, in some possible world, not a thinking thing. And we can't have something that is, in some world, both a thinking thing and not a thinking thing. So our attempt to construct a counter model where something is both a mind and a body fails. In other words, every model that makes both premises true will also make the conclusion true. Anything that is a mind is not also a body and vice versa. Now, just because the argument is valid in quantified modal logic doesn't mean it's a good argument. It doesn't mean that the conclusion is true because the premises might not be true, right? So if you are an identity theorist about the mind and the brain, you say the mind is identical to the brain, you're going to disagree with some of these premises. You might disagree with the first one. 
or you might disagree with the second one. Or you might be a physicalist who disagrees for different reasons. So you might think the mind and the brain aren't identical, but yet nevertheless, the mind, it is related in this important way. It supervenes on, it depends on, it's grounded in physical goings on. Okay, so exactly how you go about expressing that, you might reject premise one or you might reject premise two. Nevertheless, it's a really cool argument because it's logically valid. It basically tells us if you're going to be a physicalist about the mind, then you've got to come up with a theory that makes premise one false or makes premise two false. So as this example highlights, I think quantified modal logic, it really is the logic of philosophy in the sense that when we are thinking about arguments in philosophy, we are often implicitly reasoning using the language of quantified modal logic. Why? Well, because in philosophy, we're interested in things and the way they are. But we also want to know not just how they happen to be, but do they have to be that way? Could they have been some other way? And what follows from assuming that they have to be that way or that they could have been some other way? OK, that's the kind of stuff we're doing in philosophy all the time. So that's why when we're putting philosophical arguments into logical notation and trying to work out whether they're valid or not, it's quantified modal logic that we need. OK, guys, that is all for today. Thank you so much for listening. I've been going through your comments. I'm so impressed by the kind of philosophical arguments you guys have been coming up with. So I'm going to continue thinking about them, responding to them, keep them coming in. If you're finding this stuff useful, go ahead and subscribe to the channel. It's like the good news I need in the morning. In the next video, we are going to be diving deeper into quantified modal logic. We're going to be looking at how the semantics works and we're going to be building lots of models and seeing what's true and false at different possible worlds. That's going to be fun. OK, I hope you join me back for that. <laughs>